Aaron. I am one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word? This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, and it says this, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that as we continue this trek into looking at different women in the Bible, that you would, you would grow us to see the grace and the goodness that you have provided through men and women both, and how you intend for us to come together to complement one another, to see your kingdom go throughout the world, that you would be glorified and honored by how we come together and how we live unified, complementing each other to your glory and your people's good. Amen. Have a seat. Okay, so as I said, we're doing this series called Not So Little Women. This is going to take us up right through Christmas. The title is a play on Louisa May Alcott's book called Little Women. I, people don't think I'm funny, and then I do this, and they still don't think I'm funny. So She actually wrote a second book called Little Men. <laughs> Nobody read it. You don't even know that, so there you go. I, honestly, you, you don't care. Uh, <laughs> okay. I read it. One of you. That, that's why it's not... Really? Anyway, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at different stories of women in the Bible to learn what God wants us to learn from their lives, at least a little bit. Many times if you show up to a church and you hear a story about someone, it's, it's a dude. It's like a prophet, a minor prophet, a king, a farmer, a disciple. It's always some dude. And I thought it was really good to look at stories of women in the Bible and what we learn from them. Because you see a whole lot of grace and goodness and growth that God has meant for us to learn from these stories. I also thought it'd be a little bit of fun. Uh, last week, I spent the whole message pointing out how God made male and female to be image bearers of God together, to have dominion together, to steward God's creation together, not, and f- not to fight and make war, which we seem to do so much today, that we wouldn't have all these issues around you know, our genders, but we would come together and we complement one another to move God's image forward in the world. And I thought coming out of last week, that foundation out of Genesis, a natural outplay would be to look at Eve, the mother of all the living. Uh, this word is actually Chava, and it means the living. And so I thought she would be a great person to look at. But again, today is, we are going to look at Eve, but it's going to kind of be a little bit more of an overview building on last week a little bit. If you have a Bible, open to Genesis chapter 1. First book in the Bible, first chapter, pretty easy to find right after the tells you what's all the, where all the books are at. Uh, Eve is really hard to parcel out, especially because you only get snippets of her life like you do a lot of other people in the Bible. But it means there's a whole lot of blanks that people over the course of centuries have tried to fill in. And I really think Eve gets a bum rap in a lot of ways because there is millennia of just thoughts and feelings that people have that get laid upon her and they may and may or may not actually be there. You know, from last week, I was telling you that, you know, these significant women in the Bible We want to look at those in an effort to celebrate who God is, His glory, what He's doing. And so we want to celebrate women, just like we should celebrate the things that God does through men, and we should celebrate the goodness of God in every created thing. We want to do this because we want to celebrate our Creator's creativity. And so this celebrating and valuing of women, it glorifies God. One writer said this, When the value of women is rightly seen and celebrated, their Creator is honored and glorified. And I kind of have a bit of fear doing a series called Not So Little Women and talking to you about what, you know, I'm, as a dude, I'm telling you what God did through women, like I'm trying to mansplain something to you. And that is not what I'm trying to do. And if you feel that way, please forgive me in this. All right. So Eve, what do we know? Well, last week, what we looked at when God created humankind, male and female, Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, that's both of them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And so what I told you last week is a little recap. If you want to go deeper, listen to last week. But first off, Adam couldn't display God's image by himself that God intended humanity to do this together as male and female. So Eve is a compliment to Adam. Adam is a compliment to Eve. The first thing the Bible teaches us about male and female is they share the same 
nature. Each is as human as the other. Both are humankind. Both are man. Kind. This is the word Adam. The second thing is Eve was created because Adam could not have dominion by himself. He was never meant to do this on his own. So this whole idea of subduing, having dominion was something they did together. Third thing, Eve was created because Adam couldn't even properly worship God alone. A man is not a corresponding partner to a man. That doesn't mean men can't have male friends and women can't have female friends, but the idea of imaging God to creation was something that male and female were meant to do together. And that's not about marriage. I mean, it, it can be in a marriage, but it's not about marriage. It's about the human race, how we work to complement each other together. And the fourth thing is that Eve was created because mankind is not really mankind if there is not male and female. When the the man first sees the woman, Genesis 2.23, he says, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He has been looking at and naming all of these animals, and he's not finding a complementing partner. And eventually, when Eve arrives, he's like, This at last. And he says this, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, because the woman is like the man in value and dominion, but made differently to complement. And I know when I say that, I keep talking about Adam. It sounds very Adam-centric, but it's not meant to be. These words were meant to relate to that culture in a way that they would understand and draw them to see the value of one another. Now, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to be in chapter 3 and chapter 4. One of the hardest things about Eve is the first time you see her speak and talk in the Bible, her first words are recorded in conversation with the devil. And I don't know if that's the best way to introduce somebody. But anyway, so... Genesis 3.1, it starts off, the serpent is in this garden, and he is going to ask the first question in human history. And this is the question, Genesis 3.1, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So what God does in the Genesis narrative is he gives humanity this gift of this garden. You can do anything. You can eat from any tree except that one right there. And so he says everything. It's, it's kind of like today when people say, what's God's will for my life. And sometimes people think it's a tiny little dot. And if you find, if you don't find it, you're going to miss out on everything in your life. No, God's will is broad. It is love, serve, glorify. Sometimes people will even ask me, hey, do you think I could do this thing? Would that be in God's will? And I'm like, well, can you love and serve and glorify God in that? Well, I think so. Go for it. God's will is broad. It's not tiny. And this is the same thing in the garden. It is, it is huge. You can eat whatever you want. And so when the serpent shows up, it starts to pitch to Eve this idea that God is not as good as he is. That, oh, God's trying to keep you from that really nice fruit over there. I know you want to eat it, but that mean God, he's keeping you away from it. And the serpent tries to convince Eve the woman that God isn't good. So Eve responds to the serpent. Her first words, Genesis 3, uh, verses 2 and 3. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree, trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now she might be a little confused here because that's not what God actually said. Now the serpent responds, chapter 3, verse 4, you will not surely die you know what he just said? He goes, you know what, Eve? God's a big old fatty liar. That's what he just said right there. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. What? I can eat that? I'll be like God? <laughs> Here's the sad thing. Adam and Eve already were like God. They were created in his image, in his likeness. God says, you need to trust me for the good. And the devil's like, oh, no, no, no. You, you know what's good for your life. You know what you want. You should go get those things. And you're like, oh, yeah, I should go get the things that I really want. And one person once wrote this. The truth is, the more we think we are God, the farther from God we become. So true. Years ago, Milton Rokich wrote this, wrote this book. It was called The Three Christs of Ypsilanti. And he details him working with three mental patients, Leon, Joseph, and Clyde. And true story. Leon, Joseph, and Clyde all thought they were the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And so the book goes over how to, he tries to help them just to be Leon, Joseph, and Clyde. But he finds out after years they couldn't bear to live if they weren't who they thought they were. Rokich writes this. He says, they were very rational 
with aspects of life, but they would hold on to messianic delusions, even though they are grotesque, ego-defensive distortions of reality. He puts them all in a room for two years. So they worked and they ate and they did group together to see if he could dismiss this delusion in their minds. It's like the Messiah 12-step program. He puts them into it together. So one conversation, he's talking to one of the guys, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God, I'm on a mission, I was sent to save the earth. And he says, well, how do you know? And the guy says, God told me. And the other two perk up and they go, I didn't tell you anything. <laughs> now, that's funny, right? But that is the lie that we buy into and Adam and Eve bought into. I'm the one who gets to say what is right and wrong for my life. I'm the one who gets to do all these things. I don't need to trust God. I know what's best for me. That's the lie she buys into. Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree, not God, that the tree was be, to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, theologically, this is what we call the fall. It's where Adam and Eve decide to disobey God and follow their own hearts. And suffice to say that God is a good dad. He comes to them in the midst of this place where they fall. He reveals himself that he knows what is right. And so often we run towards what is wrong. We are so like Adam and Eve where we think God is not so good. And we think Satan is not so bad. But again, God comes walking in the garden. He will confront the man and the woman. The man will try and throw the woman under the bus like it's all her fault. It's a whole lot of nasty business, just like relationships today. Oh, it's her fault. No, it's his fault. And rather than complimenting one another, rather than coming together to complete one another, they start to fight against one another, just like we do today. And we blame one another for our own failings. God is going to pronounce some judgments for the people based on these actions, but he will also promise a redeemer himself that will eventually be born of a woman to save them and all of humanity. Now, throughout the last few thousand years, people have used this moment to define Eve. This is who she is. And it's true. She sinned, but also her husband joined her in her folly. And what you see is what so many people tend to forget is that God still affirmed the woman's value. He still celebrated her worth by promising to save humanity by a child that will be born through a woman. The Bible speaks consistently about God valuing women, and we see this in the crucial and indispensable role that they play throughout redemptive history. From Genesis through the book of Revelation, God values women. He includes them as a consistent, essential part of his mission. Yet because of the fall, there has been this whole litany of doctrine and theology that gets assumed, not just about Eve, but also about women. There is a view of women in many different religious traditions and even in some churches that make women feel inferior or less than. Some churches even have taught women to view themselves as insignificant, as unworthy, not only for their sin, but because you are Eve. That's who you are in your essence. And much of that comes based out of these verses in Genesis. We will claim, you know, God loves and values and honors women. But historically, even in churches, people have seen women as a temptation to be avoided, as a house slave to be employed, a voice to be silenced, a rebellious creature that needs to be subdued. Because of the way the church really and throughout history in different places, not everywhere, but in many places, but how they saw women throughout the ages, it has almost led to a backlash where there are many women today who don't want to read the Bible for fear that they will see themselves as less than. And when you truly read the scriptures, you realize women are not less than. Sure, you look in the Bible and you're going to see people as sinful and fallen and weak, but that's all of us, men and women both. I mean, humankind has been marred by sin. We have been estranged from God, but God also says that our sinfulness is not the most important thing about us. The most important thing is that God has chosen to love us, that God has chosen to redeem us in the person of Jesus Christ. And what I want to do is walk through three of these misconceptions that people have had that you might have heard. If you haven't, great day for you to come, I guess. I don't know, but you, you may not enjoy this at all. But uh, Eric Schumacher talks about this, that when he was in seminary, he said three things were taught at the seminary that stemmed from the fall. And I have heard every single one of these that he has talked about. So I want to walk through these with you just so maybe we can get a better idea of the bum rap that 
lays on women because, because of Eve. So first one is this. They say that women are more prone to mishandle the Bible. Okay. Huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, so the serpent asks Eve a question. Eve misquotes the prescription. And they say, therefore, all women are pr predisposed to get the Bible wrong without a man. Okay. Now, there are some things Eve did in Genesis 3, but they are things I have seen everybody do, men and women both. Uh, Eve lessens the goodness of God because she forgot the generosity of God when she speaks to the serpent. God told humankind, you can eat from anything. Love, serve, glorify me, anything. It's going to be amazing. Just don't eat from that tree. She lessened God's goodness. And the second thing she did was she exaggerated God's restriction. She says, oh, we're not even allowed to touch it. But do you know anybody who hasn't run towards the allure of legalism in their life? I know people who love grace, and yet grace becomes a sort of legalism in, in their life. People have said that because Eve was careless with the truth, that all women are going to be careless with the truth. This is something that's been said. Now, here's an issue with this from my perspective. Why do we assume it was a mishandling of the text what God said by the woman? Now, what I mean by that is that in Genesis 2, God creates Adam first, and God does that for a reason, you see, so they would realize their need for one another to complement each other. All indication in the Genesis narrative is that God instructed the man and gave the man the responsibility to pass that instruction on to the woman as a team. So how do we know it was an Adam who mishandled and passed that version along to the woman? We don't know. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, you know, could just be, Adam's a bad teacher. <laughs> a lot of us are. Uh, First Timothy 2, 14, we are told that the woman was deceived by going beyond what was allowed, but the Bible does not actually condemn her for being a careless interpreter of God's words. Now, to be fair, it doesn't condemn Adam either for mishandling God's word, but it does say specifically, Adam was not deceived. And what that means is Adam knew what God said. And Adam willingly chose to disobey. He didn't get the word wrong. He disobeyed it. The Bible doesn't draw attention to either person's handling of that command. So to be fair, the source of Eve's transgression wasn't necessarily in how she quoted or taught God's word. It was her deception. Eric Schumacher says this, let's not mishandle God's word while accusing someone of mishandling God's word. Ooh, that's a great thing right there. Adam sinned not because he listened to a woman. It's because he listened to his wife in that moment who said something opposite of what God said and ate from a tree which God said not to. And I can tell you today of lots of women who have listened to harebrained ideas of their husbands and gotten into a whole lot of trouble. The emphasis does not fall on listening to an embodied female, but in believing something that says the opposite of what God says, whether it's a man or a woman, anytime, anywhere, we go with what the word of God says. We trust what God says. When people say something the opposite of it, we go with what God says. <sighs> I need a soapbox. So Genesis 3 does not teach that women are inherently less skilled in the word of God than men. Second thing is this. They say the woman tempted and seduced the man. Therefore, women are chiefly to blame for the sin of men. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> There are many people who fear this to be true. There was actually a sect of Pharisees in Jesus' day. They're known as the bruised and bleeding. And they would bruise and bleeding because whenever women walked by, they'd look the other way and they'd run into things and bonk their heads and they'd start, start to bleed. And they blamed that on the women. It's really weird. So you go back. Eve was deceived. Okay, She takes the fruit. She eats of it. But notice in the text, Adam is right there with her. He's not like off somewhere. There's this old Puritan proverb that said, uh, wow. Well, Adam was away, Eve went astray. And that's not true because the text tells you Adam was standing right there. There is no record of him trying to stop her or confront the serpent. Because look, if you're anywhere and a snake comes up and starts going, hey, eat this fruit, be like, that is weird, a talking snake. Kick it in the face. And then go. Okay. I don't know. The, no scripture presents Eve's action as one of subduction or temptation. It does not do that. And to be sure, the Bible is not afraid to call out seductresses. It does it all through it and doesn't say she was one. There is not blame anywhere in the Bible of Eve tempting Adam to eat this fruit with her feminine ways. She doesn't walk up and say, oh, hey, big boy, you want to lay a hold of this fruit? You got to have that fruit first. She doesn't do that. Okay. If anything, the blame lands more squarely on the man than the woman. 
The woman did not cause the man to sin. Yes, she offered him the fruit. But what does he do? He eats it he, of his own accord. And this reminds us we are all responsible before God for our own sin. Sure, you're driving somewhere and that guy cuts you off. If you flip him off and start screaming in your car, that's on you. That's your response. Too often, people in relationships and marriage like this, it's like, look what you made me do. No, that's not a defense in marriage, and it's not a legal defense in front of God for our sin. And it's sad that throughout the ages, Eve has become this example and a warning about the danger of women, of what they pose to men. Now look, uh, do I think women should dress modestly? Yes, I do. But that is not a fault in women. That is a fault in men across this entire planet. This is why, you know, in court cases that are defending men against sexual assault, they will typically ask what the woman was wearing. Like, like it matters. Like it matters. Really, really. I mean, ladies, look, you can help dudes out by covering your baby making parts. That really helps us out, okay? Because men are weak. But you look at Jesus. He was not afraid or distant from women. He sits alone in John chapter four with a woman at this well. The longest recorded uh, talk that Jesus has with somebody in the book of John is with this woman who had been divorced five times, living with this guy. She's on her sixth guy at this point, which is just your outcast. And Jesus sits and he talks with her in one of the longest recorded narratives in the New Testament. He lets a prostitute wash his feet with her hair down. That's an intimate touch in that day. You cannot blame women for men's shortcomings. Third thing is this. They say women are by nature are out to overcome and oppose men. And actually, this one's true, but I think we both do this to each other. All right. We both want to overcome and oppose each other. So this comes about in Genesis 3. After they sin and fall, God hands out some judgment on the man and the woman's sin. And this is what he says to the woman. Genesis 3, 16. He says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, some people read that and they go, oh, look, the man's supposed to rule over the woman. This is the result of the fall. Uh, this word for rule is actually the word dominion that they were both supposed to share in Genesis chapter 1. And so you got to come back to what's this word desire? Well, there's two ways this word is used in the Bible. The first one you can see is in Genesis chapter 4. You have this guy named Cain. He's about to kill his brother Abel. And God tells Cain, Genesis 4 verse 7, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And so this view says that because of sin, it's going to corrupt the woman's heart and she will not want to be a compliment to her husband. Instead, she'll want to usurp his authority and then try to control him. The second way you see this word desire is in relationships. Song of Songs, chapter 7, verse 10, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. And so in that view, the woman will continue to desire to be a helper to her husband and she'll desire to fill the earth, to exercise dominion with him. But that desire is going to be met with frustration at every single place. Now, really, this word desire, it means to turn towards, unto. And what the text is telling you is that instead of her desire being for God, her desire is now turned from God towards a creature. And anytime our desire moves away from desiring what God wants for us first to a creature, we are always going to have conflict. Now, scripturally speaking, what you will see later is that the Apostle Paul will say, man is the head of the woman as Christ is the head of the church. And people get this kind of really confused. This word is called kephale. And kephale refers to like the headwaters of a river. And what it points to is this place of creation of where how God originally created mankind, how we're meant to do this together. And really you have all these things about subduing and dominion and responsibility, exercising all these things over the earth. And what it's telling you is that it's going to be very hard for people to do this because of our own sin, because of what we have done. The simplest way to understand this is human beings are now going to struggle in every part of our lives trying to be in a place where we complement one another instead of fighting against one another. And in our present day, this conflict comes out in chauvinism and extreme feminism. And the reality is this happened because, if I can be honest, Adam was a coward. And there seems to be a propensity where men and women now have a hard time trusting each other. And honestly, we know the two things that typically bring women the most pain are children and men. <laughs> it's, it's just as true, right? We, we, and I'm not here to pick on men, but I get to pick on Adam because I am a guy. And I can say, I, I don't know what I would have done. I, I might have been just like this guy. You know, we know that Eve felt this way. If you look at Adam, 
honestly, again, Adam, Adam was an idiot, but Eve was deceived. Eve was deceived. We both have to take responsibility for our own sin rather than trying to blame one another all the time because that's what happens here. I cannot tell you today how many women I meet that want to date a guy that they can tell what to do. They want to rule over a guy. Guys, ladies, I will tell you, you want someone you can compliment in your life. Guys, you want someone who can compliment you in your life. So we learn to do this together because I think most women ultimately when they get married, they want a guy who inspires safety and courage and truth. You don't want a chauvinistic, rude little boy who can pound 15 beers in a row. We are called to be a people who learn to do life together with each other, not fighting, not ruling over, not having dominion over one another. We want to be those who compliment each other, but because of the fall, it makes it very difficult. Now, let's look at Eve. Okay, so Genesis chapter 4, if you're still there, go to Genesis chapter 4. After the fall, they get placed outside of this garden. Genesis 4 verse 1 says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Now Genesis is now telling you that men and women make babies. You may be like, well, duh. Well, if you look at the Genesis narrative, God makes the man, he makes the woman out of the side of the man to show that they are equal, supposed to do life together. And now it's telling you that men and women make babies just like the rest of creation. They are creating and moving forward after their own kind. And what it also tells you is that that sin nature that they have now fallen into also gets passed on to us. It's, it's like you have a two-year-old. You never have to tell a two-year-old their favorite words, no and mine. It's like the first things that they learn. Psalm 58, verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth speaking lies. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how does Eve respond to her pregnancy? She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, the English translation, really trying to help Eve out here, really trying to help her out, because this is literally translated as, together with God, I've made a man. I mean, she's, she's saying, I was made from a male, now I make the males. It's very arrogant in the text. Her words in Hebrew are kind of this idea that God promises to send a Savior. In Genesis chapter 3, it's going to cr- Savior's going to crush Satan, going to bring redemption. And like us, Eve has no patience, and she thinks she just gave birth to that person. Woo! Glad I didn't have to wait a long time for God to send that Savior. Jonathan Edwards believed that this passage should be translated, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Not, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. I have gotten a man, the Lord. She kind of says, God made a man. So did I. So did I. And it refers to the problem that humanity has in their fallen state. We think we know all the answers. It's not that we are just fighting one another. We're also fighting God and what he says over our lives. She thinks her child is going to fix the world. I know a lot of you moms feel that way too. Okay. (laughs) So far, you've seen the man and the woman. They think they know better than God. They want to step outside his will. They rebel against him. Then they try to control one another. Then they try to fix their sin on their own. And now Eve thinks she's going to fix it through her child. God made a promise. It's got to happen right now. Almost as an afterthought, you get verse 2. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now here there's no she conceived, which makes people think that Abel is a twin that uh, they didn't know he was coming, like she bursts Cain, and then like a late night infomercial, it's like, oh no, there's more. Here, you get a, a second child. It's coming out. Uh, Abel's name can mean breath. It can mean nothingness. And it almost seems like they're dismissing Abel. Now, if you don't know what happens in the story, you've never heard this, it's that Cain, rather than saving the world, because he's not Jesus, Cain will kill his brother Abel over jealousy of who worships God better. So glad our world's over that. Oh my goodness. Guys, I am not saying that as Christians, we don't believe in the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But we understand that exclusive way to come into a relationship with God is inclusive. We open up our arms. We invite everybody in. There is nothing wrong with saying that this is who God is and how he's called us to love and worship him. But we're not going to kill anybody over it. But Cain does. So uh, let me just say, if you were wondering, not the Messiah. Okay, so here now becomes the true beginnings of wisdom because rather than doubling down, the last words you say, uh, hear Eve say in the text are when she has her next child because Eve realizes, oh, my hope was in myself. Oh, my hope was in my child. The next child you read, Genesis 4, 25 and 26, and Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called his name Seth for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel for Cain killed him. 
Now again, it's hard to discern from the English uh, translation of that text, but here she does not say, look, I just birthed the Savior of the world, which again is how a lot of parents feel until your kids hit two. Then you're like, no, it's a spawn of Satan. What did I, you know. You know uh, what, what, what Eve does now is in the text, she humbly receives this child as a gift from God. She says, really in the text, this is a gift that God has appointed for me. And what that tells you is after all the places where Eve has run, she's learning. And that's the beauty of Eve's story. She ends in humility, not humiliated, but she ends in humility. And it's a humility we would all do better if we learned. We have run from God. We have sinned. We have tried to find our own answers on our own, and we failed every time. So we should come to a place that Eve does, and humbly trust God for His provision. There are so many places the gospel is shown in Eve's story. They, they sin in the garden. Who comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day? God does. God comes looking for them. She has a baby thinking it's Jesus. He is not, but God will give more grace with another child. And when she surrenders to that grace, she lives in humility and recognizes that God Himself is our Savior. And she waits, and she looks forward to God's coming promise. She lets God be God, as we all should. What do we learn from Eve? We learn that through our lives, yes, we mess up. Yes, we make a lot of dumb decisions. But we are a people who need to come to God in that place of humbleness. That we must let God be God over our lives. That we trust who He has said He is as we come into relationship with Him again. Adam and Eve ran from relationship with God. God comes to restore that relationship. That's the beauty of the gospel that God does with us as well. We have been like Eve. We run from God. God comes to restore relationship with us. Our sin has broken that relationship with God and with other people. And yet what happens is in Christ, God comes and He dies in our place for our sin to remove what stood between us and God and us and one another to bring us to Himself. That's why I invite you to communion every week because communion is a reminder of what Jesus did. That's why you break a cracker and you dip it in the wine or the grape juice as a reminder of what Jesus did to rescue and save us. I mean, Jesus says, you know, when you gather together, you know, do this in remembrance of me. There, there's nothing magical about communion. What communion does, it's a reminder and it resets our hearts and our minds back to what salvation truly looks like, where it's really found. And it's in the person of Christ. It sets us back to a place of humility, where we get... <laughs> I, never, I was going to make a joke. Never. <laughs> It takes us back to a place of humility where we become just this, this humble people and, that, and we sit amazed at the grace of God. I don't even think to throw at him right now. Just, um, and we sit amazed at, at, at the grace and the goodness of God, a, as we should. And so we're going to invite you to communion today. We don't, we don't pass communion throughout the room. What we do with communion is you've got to get up and actually take it. If, if you are a believer and you trust in Christ, you, you take it as a reminder of what God has done. As if you need prayer, if you're in a place today where, you, where maybe you're a woman, you feel like you have been you know, placed less than or placed under in a, a church setting or something like that, or maybe you're in a relationship right now and you're both vying for who has dominance and who gets to be in control and it's destroying your relationship, we'd love to pray with you about that. We, we would love to, to walk through some of those things with you. If you need prayer, right across the way in the lounge, across the way, you can go during the music, you can go after service. We'd love to be able to, to pray with you. Um, we invite you to grab the sermon notes that are there. Again, just those four questions we're going through every week and understanding what the gospel is. And if you would like to give, uh, there's offering boxes on, on the side wall. You can give online at Element. We do not pass an offering plate because we believe that our giving is meant to be in response to what God has done. And our response, we, I believe, makes us more generous when we begin to do it and understand the generosity of God. That our God has sought us out in the places that we have run, that we, re we rebelled against Him, that we have placed ourselves over Him and thinking, I know what's right. I don't need to listen to you. And yet God has always been good. He has always been the one who has brought us back to Himself in His own mercy and His own goodness. And that should make us a humble people and come to a place just like Eve was the last time you see her in a place of understanding God's grace and His mercy that was extended towards her. Let's pray. Father, this morning we ask that you would take in and move us to begin to understand the grace and mercy that we have received. And not only understanding it, 
that we would understand why we need to receive it. That we are not the center of the world, that we don't get to make all the decisions for our lives, that we trust your leading and your guidance where you send us, who you call us to be, because you made us and you know us. And if we are honest, God, there are so many places that we fight, not just against each other, but we fight against you. We wanna have rule and dominion over you. And the reality is that's just never gonna happen because you are God and you are sovereign and yet you are good. So much better than we could ever imagine. And so I ask that you would teach us to come to the place that Eve did, a place of humility, because humility, living a humble life, leads to a life of wisdom. Because wise people trust you. And I ask as we begin to live in that wisdom, that our lives would then be lived out in ways that reflect your goodness to those around us that our goal would not be to have dominance over one another, but our goal would be to display the grace that we have first received, that we would speak the truth, that we would believe that Jesus is the only way into relationship with you because of his sacrifice in our place. But we'd also understand that you are calling us as your ambassadors to open up our arms to those in the world around us so that all people know that they are welcomed and can come in. And we would honor you by how we do that and live our lives in response to you. And we ask this in your son's good name, amen.